Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. Uh, we have two speakers that will be going and they'll be talking in two separate parts. Uh, so I'm going to introduce part one um, and then uh, halfway through, I believe we'll be able to introduce part two, but we can just run that through with them. So let's first introduce part one. Uh, it's Adele LaFranc and Reed Robeson. And part one of their talk is the good, the bad, and the ugly, contraindications, optimal conditions, and psycho-spiritual emergencies in psychedelic medicine. Adele is a clinical psychologist, research scientist, and co-developer of emotion-focused family therapy. She is also a leader in the research and practice of psychedelic medicine for eating disorders. Reed Robeson is a board-certified psychiatrist who has led over 100 clinical trials. He is founder and medical director at Cedar Psychiatry and serves as coordinating coordinating investigator for the MAPS MDMA assisted psychotherapy study of eating disorders. Reed often consults on medical safety issues and psychedelic medicine use. Um, so thank you both for joining us, Adele and Reed. Uh, and just before we get started, would you like me to uh, introduce the second talk or would you both like to kind of just carry it in and, and take the hour to um, uh, facilitate yourselves? Yeah, well, we'll take the hour. So if you want to if you want to introduce a second talk, that's totally fine. Now or later, it works for us. Okay. Well, the, the second part we'll be talking about is safety considerations and prohibited medications for psychedelic experiences. What does the science say? Reed and Adele, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Thanks for having us. Um, we'll get started. Uh, so first of all, thanks for the opportunity. It's really great for us to be able to talk about one of our passion projects. Um, we're involved in a number of different research and clinical projects related to different substances. And one of the things that we really feel strongly about is not only talking about the potential and the positive outcomes related to psychedelics, but also talking about uh, the bad and the ugly so that we can uh, move forward in this space in an ethical, uh, safe manner, both psychologically and um, from a psychiatric point of view. And of course, there's, there's so many topics that we could cover in today's hour, um, but we are gonna focus on uh, optimal conditions, contraindications, psycho-spiritual emergencies, and then the safety considerations from, um, in terms of medication. Um, so part one uh, will focus on those conditions and those contraindications. And first of all, we do want to say that there is so much to celebrate in this space. I'll never forget when I was first introduced to psychedelic medicine and I got to witness some healing in, in individuals who, despite their best efforts, were not able to receive the benefits that conventional medicine had to offer. And it really transformed um, the pathway for my career, our careers, and um, it's, it's breathed new life, actually, for me into the whole field of, of psychology and, and psychiatry. And so I just want to share my genuine enthusiasm and excitement for this work. In fact, I just did a quick Google search to see like what's in the news. And there's so many headlines every day. Um, you know, with things to celebrate. So that's that's the first step. And I'll jump in here. I remember growing up with the This Is Your Brain on Drugs campaigns. And uh, we talk a lot about the overscheduling of these tools for healing and how we have some, uh, some progress to make in that area. But I just wanted to point out the evidence around uh, psychedelics and mental health from a population standpoint. Uh, first of all, that there is no clear-cut evidence of any increased rate of mental health problems uh, due to psychedelic usage. In fact, uh, everything points to decreased rate, if, if anything, decreased rates of suicide and psychological distress among those who 
report prior use of psychedelics and we've seen the response rate in psychedelic studies when used therapeutically, the, the results are, are striking in a positive way. And there are, of course, some complications, and that's part of what we'll be focusing on. There are some things to be aware of, some things to screen for, and uh, be prepared to navigate when they arise. But, but still, the rate of complications, uh, psychiatric and otherwise, is quite low, quite rare. Um, this one study I pointed out from 2011 on the third bullet point talks about mental health complications following a psychedelic experience are, are extremely low, even as low as 0.1% and lower if you do proper screening. And uh, the abuse potential we'll get into later on as well. But this, uh, these medicines are more anti-addictive as we know than they are addictive. We'll move on to the next slide. And so despite all these positives, you know, we really do believe it's important to have a balanced view of these medicines so that we can move forward in a good way. So um, we do need to consider how we can maximally use these, um, these technologies, you know. And so for this part of the talk, the information and the data comes from participants who we've interviewed in the context of research studies practitioners we've interviewed in the context of research studies, as well as our own experiences, uh, both clinically and in the research space. So in terms of optimal con conditions, this is a topic that people are um, discussing much more frequently than in the past. And so we'll just do a quick review and, and with some highlights. Uh, if you're watching this, you've probably already heard of the set and setting and the importance of set and setting in psychedelic drug experience. And that refers to one's mindset, but also the setting in which they are planning to experience um, these psychedelics. Uh, so it's important to kind of come with an openness, a willingness, intentionality around healing for sure, and to make sure that the setting is safe and free from distraction. Um, and I would add that uh, for individuals who, uh, who are perhaps more vulnerable, that it would be important to have more than one facilitator. I know for myself, um, as a woman in this culture, I would feel much more comfortable with a female facilitator. And so there, these are points to consider, um, depending on who the client population is. Um, conscious preparation. Depending on the medicine, there are different protocols in terms of lifestyle, uh, diet, um, meditation practices in order to optimize your experience uh, with the medicines. Community is really, really important, um, especially when I think about a medicine like ayahuasca. You know, So ayahuasca is traditionally in the context of indigenous culture where it is part of the fabric of the culture. And so, um, there's integration already before you even um, before you even have an experience with the medicine, and so for for people from North America or different places in Europe, it's really important to think about the uh, the value of community both before having a psychedelic experience, but also after having had that experience. Um, one of the one of the uh, criteria that I really appreciate and applications for psychedelic medicine opportunities is, uh, you know, do you have close-knit friends and family with whom you can share your experiences? That seems to be important. Um, and that, it, that becomes part of this, what we call conscious integration. So you're consciously working towards integrating your experiences in different ways. You can integrate your experiences through discussion, storytelling, um, you know, sharing narratives, but you can also integrate using body-based techniques. Um, you can integrate through art, through journaling, and other practices that support uh, contemplation. And then finally, um, and we might be a little bit biased because the fact that I'm a psychologist and Rita's a psychiatrist, but we really do believe in the value of bridging medicine, psychedelic medicine use with conventional mental health protocols. In fact, it's something that I'm pretty passionate about because 
yes, conventional medicine um, isn't enough and it's not enough for many people. And also we have such richness in terms of what we've learned over the years of what works in psychotherapy in in um, psychotrope in the psychotropic world that it it really um, makes the most sense to bring these two worlds together so that they can work together in a really good way. And so here's a little quote from one of the studies that Reed and I are working on right now. Um, Medicine-friendly physicians and psychotherapists could support individuals in the planning process, including with the PrEP diet, as well as post-retreat, and especially in the event a surge of symptoms occurs. They may also act as a support to individuals who find themselves struggling to integrate experiences of healing from the use of medicine and previous or ongoing conventional treatments. So that's a quote from a ceremony leader of ayahuasca who talked about the value of bridging these opportunities with medicine-friendly physicians and psychotherapists. And we certainly support that. In fact, one of the research studies that I completed a couple of years ago showed that for some people, you know, they traveled to South America to have these experiences. They came home and, you know, a, a lot more open and with material to process rising to the surface in a fast and furious way. And at that time, you know, a number of years ago, they didn't have anyone to talk to about it. And so they're having a surge of symptoms, um, but not the appropriate supports because they felt uncomfortable telling people what they'd done and why they were feeling this way. And so a missed opportunity there that we're really hoping to um, bridge that gap with the work that we're doing. In terms of contraindications, um, both our experiences, but also uh, some research that we were that we've been conducting, medical and psychological fragility are, are contraindications that a number of people can agree on. Now, how we define medical or psychological fragility is a completely other topic, and we'll discuss a little bit more about those aspects um, in the second part. But just to know that. Um, we've seen it, it, it comes up in research, and it's something that uh, facilitators in the space largely agree on, that um, it, it can be too risky um, to administer these types of medicines to people who have that. Uh, certain medications don't work well with psychedelics, although there is some interesting discussion about um, where these contraindications regarding medications come from. Does it come from medical science? Does it come from spirituality? And, and it's important to look at both, but we'll say more about that in part two. And then um, on the flip side of community, which I mentioned in the previous slide, lack of social support. Um, you know, more and more as I do work in this space, I feel strongly about um, helping people to share with their family and friends what they're going to be doing so that they can have that built-in community around them. Um, but I've also seen and heard of situations where the individual participated in the retreat, went home and didn't have a lot of social support around medicine use, but also uh, were unemployed, had housing issues, and there is a certain um, degree of internal and external resources that I believe is, is uh, optimal in order to have a positive uh, experience with these types of medicines. So here the, here's another quote. So I guess whoever you see with the most fragile mind, so there's a different level of fragile mind, even in the population we're choosing to serve, you can always see where that maybe I can't help that person or everyone here is fragile, but that person right there is probably too fragile to even make it through. So just um, gauge, gauging those things. And so um, screening ends up being a really, really important process of working with psychedelic medicines and having just gone through uh, with Reed and with MAPS, a process of um, FDA, uh, approval for a study. It's like, it was quite a rigorous process. And I was very appreciative of that process because it was making me think that we could increase the rigor of selection and screening processes across the board in terms of psychedelic use. As Adele mentioned, we're both involved 
in an upcoming MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study for eating disorders that's sponsored by MAPS. And the MAPS protocols that they so graciously share with the world, and you can find online for a variety of studies, give a really nice framework for how to approach this work in general and what issues to think about. And one thing to point out before I go through some of these is that studies are very specific for a couple of reasons. One is to focus in on a very specific sample, uh, including the indication of interest and eliminate noise and confounding variables to maximize the chances of detecting a true signal, but also for safety. And that's uh, what I wanted to highlight most but it's important to keep in mind that uh, we also want to open up these effective tools in the right way to as many people as possible to alleviate as much suffering as possible. So the goal of this isn't to be more and more re restrictive, it's to be aware of the risks and, and navigate them consciously. Uh, for example, the first bullet point here says psychotic disorders, and you, you may have seen that Psychedelic studies often include anyone with not only a personal history of psychosis, but even some studies include uh, immediate family members with psychosis. And, and that uh, doesn't mean it will always be the case. It doesn't mean they, that uh, some of these tools wouldn't potentially be helpful for individuals who would be excluded from this study in particular. Uh, but it does mean that we need to be aware of the added risk in that individual and proceed with caution. And uh, same goes for these other mental health conditions, uh, psychedelics. Uh, with psychedelics, there might be an increased risk of, of triggering or uh, a manic episode or a dissociative episode or a psychotic, uh, psychotic features along with a depressive state. Uh, eating disorder with active purging is listed on here because of electrolyte imbalances with special relevance to MDMA. But I, I should point out that Adele and I hope to study MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for bulimia at one point. And the upcoming study is for anorexia and binge eating disorder in particular. Uh, and same goes for suicidality. The, uh, there is potential of these tools to treat uh, individuals with uh, who are struggling with uh, suicidal ideation or even suicidal behavior, but but there are added uh, safety considerations, of course, with this with with uh, individuals in that uh, category. Cardiac considerations really depend on the medicine you're working with, but in general, they're an important thing to consider because many psychedelics, uh, whether it's uh, MDMA or ayahuasca, can or even uh, ketamine can increase your heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, and for most people that doesn't, that's not significant and it's not more than a session of active exercise, for example, but for individuals with underlying cardiac disease, that could be a problem and requires careful screening. Same goes with uh, the use of antidepressants. If you're going into an ayahuasca ceremony, of course, that has unique considerations and those could be could be uh, dangerous in terms of a plant medicine uh, antidepressant interaction. Um, but with other medicines, say psilocybin, it's uh, something to consider, but not as much of a, of a pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic interaction and could be navigated uh, potentially with the right uh, medical and uh, support team in place. Um, and then uh, the last point is just doing an overall medical and psychiatric screening and, and following your judgment on, um, on addressing, ex excluding, diving in deeper on anything that, uh, that you feel may be a safety consideration. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about emergencies all the fun stuff. Um, so first we can talk about psychospiritual emergencies and there's definitely a continuum of what is considered to be a psychospiritual emergency and different um, intensities of that experience. Um, but it's, it's important to talk about because I don't think we talk about it often enough. And when we talk about it, we talk about it as really rare event, but it happens. And I think it's important to alert participants 
um, both who are using these substances in retreat centers, but also in the context of um, research studies, that it is possible that they will experience significant effect or altered perceptions, hallucinations, um, et cetera, for a period that is longer than what, have been, what would have been predicted. So, because um, that can be really, really frightening. And a number of years ago, um, you know, someone knew that I was doing some research in this area and I got a call uh, because there was an individual who had participated in an underground ayahuasca ceremony and they uh, were still experiencing really, really significant effects. And it was starting to fall into the domain of psychosis. And this woman was, you know, alone at home in her apartment and there was no safety protocol. And um, so we were, we, what we were able to do is get her to a hospital so that she could get psychiatric care. And, and even then there was this question like, should we bring her there or not? Because there was a negative bias around conventional medicines. And yet this poor woman is really experiencing this um, very distressing altered state. And so it really, it really helped me to see that this is an important topic that we need to be taught, that we need to be discussing as a field, as a community. Um, not just so that we know that it happens, but also so that we can think really clearly about what to do when it happens. And Reed will talk more about different psycho-spiritual emergencies um, in the second talk, but I, I wanted to at least share that point. The other piece is that um, physical crisis or violence can happen too. And um, when I was you know, reading uh, consciousness medicine and, and learning about different protocols for psychedelic use. Oftentimes people have these parameters that they share with participants that there's no physical violence, but it's not always something that you can um, predict. It's not always something that you can control because people are under the effect of really strong medicine. And so I really do believe that a buddy system is very important in terms of facilitators. Uh, single facilitators, uh, it's not something that I support personally. Um, and I just think about other emergencies, like, for example, what if there's a single facilitator of a psychedelic medicine experience one-on-one -on -one with a participant, and that facilitator, for whatever reason, loses consciousness. And then there's this participant, this patient, this client, in a super vulnerable state, who's now completely alone. And um, again, these things don't happen very often, but they do happen. And so I think it's important to talk about it so that, so that we can kind of be thinking about how to increase safety when we're using these medicines. So here's another quote from a study that, we've, uh, that we're in the process of um, moving through a ceremonial leader from ayahuasca this time. Yes, I heard a story about someone who, in my opinion, poured for someone they shouldn't have poured for. And the guy went crazy during the ceremony, took off all of his clothes, police had to be called. And that was really traumatic for the other participants. I mean, the police hauled this naked man away from an ayahuasca ceremony. That's really traumatic for everybody. One more thing that might fall in the physical crisis or violence or might be and something that I feel strongly about is uh, sexual violence, sexual assault, rape. Uh, when, I, when I did a study a number of years ago with, with a number of collaborators, we interviewed um, 23 people, I believe, who had had ayahuasca experiences ceremonially. And out of those 23 people, one person um, had an experience of sexual assault. And so it made me wonder like, hi, huh, I wonder if that represents what's going on in the world. Is one in 23 women or one in 23 people have one of these experiences? Then uh, I'm really grateful to the, the folks at Shakruna who actually have developed a document around um, this topic to help people um, make decisions that increase their safety and help them know what to do if they're in trouble. But it is something that, again, is it's part of the underbelly of the psychedelic world that we need to talk about, we need to look at, uh, we need to bring into the light so that uh, we can help people to have experiences where they are safe. Um, and if something happens, know what to do and how to get the help that they need um, because yeah it happens if you haven't already participated in the questionnaire that the survey that shakruna has put together to study this phenomenon i really encourage you to do that um, you can find it on their website 
so far though. So there is so much to be excited about. And usually I'm, I'm t doing a conference talk about all of the exciting things. And so know that I am very excited and, and Reed and I share that excitement. Um, but it's also really, really important for us to talk about how to optimize experiences, um, how to mitigate suffering and adverse events. We are not of the opinion that everything happens for a reason. We do believe that there are, um, that we can um, minimize unnecessary suffering. And uh, we really believe in the importance of working together with conventional medicine. Now, when we say that, we're referring to people who are, who are having psychedelic experiences in North America or cultures where uh, psychedelic medicine isn't an embedded in the fabric of the culture. Obviously, that's not gonna be true in different indigenous populations. Um, but for people who are um, embedded in a culture where conventional medicine is dominant, we really do believe that it can help in so many ways to bridge the gaps between those two worlds. And then finally, um, and because psychedelic medicines show such promise and because there are people who are suffering deeply and not able to get the help that they need, sometimes you know, um, people say yes to offering psychedelic medicine when really they should say no because the risks are just too high given what we know um, at, at this time. And so I think that's another piece that we wanna bring forward is how to say no to those for whom the risks are just too high at this time. And we'll say more about those specific risks right now. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. This is a graph you may have seen showing the safety of, uh, of drugs in general. Uh, what uh, the government would call drugs of abuse and what we're talking about here as uh, you know, psychedelic therapeutics. If you look at the far right, the safest on the list, three of the four safest are psilocybin, LSD, and MDMA. Uh, there's an old study from the 70s that I've always found interesting where eight individuals thought they were consuming cocaine, but they actually insufflated LSD and ended up with 20 or 30 times uh, a regular dose of LSD. And while it was not a pleasant experience for them and they did require uh, some significant medical treatment, all of them survived and that would not have been the case, of course, with some, with some of these medicines on the far left of this curve, including what they, uh, the drug that they were accustomed to using um, in 2016, there was a study of, I think, 12,000 uh, users of, of psilocybin, and the rate of those needing medical treatment was less than 0.2%. Um, let's go to the next slide. And this just uh, to point out the, the difference in using uh, psychotropic medication versus psychedelic medicines as a uh, as therapeutic modalities. And uh, I should give the disclaimer that as a psychiatrist, I do prescribe SSRIs and they do have a role and they do work for many people, but they, there are so many more individuals who are still suffering, who still have uh, depressive symptoms, uh, symptoms of anxiety that aren't fully addressed by their psychotherapy or their medication regimen. And we are in desperate need of new tools. And one thing I really like about psychedelics as medicine is that uh, compared to SSRIs that uh, bring about some emotional blunting through their mechanism, psychedelics uh, lead to enhanced uh, sensitivity and connection with one's emotions. And when you com combine that with the psychedelic support we're talking about, uh, the results can be very powerful. Let's go to the next slide. There's a resource out there put, put together by a pharmacist and the website I have in the bottom right corner called spiritpharmacist.com. His name is Benjamin Malcolm. And uh, he put together this really uh, useful table that shows uh, Medication. There are two pages of this. We'll advance in a moment, but on this first page, it shows SSRIs, SNRIs, and related medicines, as well as Wellbutrin and and uh, 
mirtazapine that's in a class of its own, and you can go through the columns and look at uh, what special considerations there are if you go over to the, the ayahuasca column, MAOI containing ayahuasca or Syrian rue, it does point out the potential life-threatening toxicity that can come by combining uh, antidepressants and, and ayahuasca that has an MAOI inhibitor in the plant mixture. And, and so that needs to be carefully addressed and is why, as you probably know, uh, both uh, ceremonial leaders and, and uh, clinical professionals alike will uh, instruct some very careful uh, tapering off of antidepressant medicines before uh, working with that plant medicine in specific. Um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, this, the list goes on, but if you, if you look at the row on MAOI inhibitors, there is an older class of antidepressant medicines that came out uh, decades ago, even before tricyclic antidepressants, uh, that are MAOI inhibitor medications like Nardil and Parnate and Marplan, and they're not used very often anymore, but they are effective and still used. Um, there's even a new version of uh, one of these called Selegiline that is, has the brand name MSAM. Uh, you see it on the last, uh, last row. And these are extremely important to be aware of when working with uh, certain medicines like ayahuasca. Um, and this table might serve a, a reference, but in general, we wanted to point it out um, to uh, highlight the myriad factors that need to be considered when uh, leading someone into a, a course of treatment involving psychedelic therapy. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. I like this uh, quote from Albert Hoffman after he ingested 250 micrograms of LSD and then went home. He, he said it was initially quite an unpleasant experience. His neighbor turned into a malevolent, insidious witch with a colored mask, and he felt uh, the outer world disintegrate, ego dissolution, seized by a dreadful fear of going insane. It does uh, remind me of some uh, when uh, we've worked in uh, other countries with some medicines like ayahuasca, uh, what some people say after uh, a ceremony or two, when they go through that dark night of the soul, when they have that emotional breakthrough and do the hard work. And just like Albert Hoffman's experience, uh, in the end, well, he says, I then slept to awake the next morning with a clear head, a sensation of well-being and renewed life flowed through me. Breakfast tasted delicious and gave me extraordinary pleasure. When I later walked out into the garden in which the sun shone now after a spring rain, everything glistened and sparkled in a fresh light. The world was as if, it, as if newly created. Um, and so when LSD was uh, distributed as samples to uh, psychiatrists and other clinicians all over by Sandoz, uh, there were two main applications that were stipulated. One was psychotherapy because LSD and psychedelics in general uh, could elicit the uh, release of repressed material, access to uh, subconscious material, and a break from these uh, tightly held patterns, uh, anxieties, and uh, obsessional um, kind of uh, obsessional thoughts that uh, bind someone. And then the second uh, which is an interesting use is as an experimental model of psychosis. So if you dig into the literature on this, you can see how LSD and even ketamine have been used as a model of psychosis or trying to develop new meds to treat uh, conditions like schizophrenia. Um, but the difference uh, is going through these, these experiences with, uh, with purpose, intention, and in a therapeutic manner as, as one of the main differences. We can go on to the next slide. Um, figured we'd talk about something that does arise during, uh, during psychedelic medicine sessions, and also a phenomenon that maybe we don't talk about enough to watch out for that can result from these. Uh, next slide. It's called the uh, HPPD. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So I'll define what it is, but first of all, where do hallucinations come from? How does one 
hallucinate. Uh, and there are three main main pathways. We talk a lot about 5-HT2A receptors, and rightly so. This is the main path for uh, the uh, halluc hallucinations that come from uh, classic psychedelics. Uh, but what about ketamine? What about uh, how do these differ from uh, psychotic illness, for example? So if, if we break them down into three pathways, there's activation of dopamine receptors, D2 receptors in particular, that might come from a high dose of, of a stimulant like uh, methamphetamine. And uh, this is more often more of an auditory hallucination, more of a paranoid and agitated type of presentation, and doesn't have the same kind of insight that can come from the uh, second pathway on this list, which is uh, the main pathway, and this is oversimplifying, of course, but the main pathway that hallucinations come from in psychedelic medicine work is through the serotonin system, and they're, they're more visual in general, and not always. They, uh, they have more of a mystical type of delusions, more insight work, and then ketamine works through this third pathway for the most part by blocking NMDA receptors uh, as a dissociative anesthetic. And uh, with a little less of that inherent insight, but still quite possible working with ketamine a lot, uh, it, it shares that trait of relaxing these tightly held beliefs and giving access to that repressed material to be able to work with. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. A little comment on how hallucinations show up in the brain, just because I find it interesting, is there's this uh, part of the brain, uh, the clostrum, uh, the root of the word means hidden away. It's this thin uh, layer across hemispheres that uh, connects all parts of the cortex serotonin rich. And what happens with uh, a classic psychedelic when those 5-HT2A receptors are hit, uh, there's something called end inhibition or end stopping that happens where the triggering of the serotonin, some of the serotonin receptors uh, are found on these GABAergic inhibitory interneurons that turn off the the visual cortex's ability to clearly define the edges of, of objects, which leads to this blurring of edges, wavy edges, trails of, of things uh, that uh, are moving in your visual field. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And one more. HPPD is, is a condition found in the DSM-5 even, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it's been there since uh, the DSM-3. And uh, stands for hallucin Hallucinogen Persisting Perception Disorder. And I think the persisting part is a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't always persist. And uh, this is probably more of a phenomenon than we even talk about, as you can see in Albert Hoffman's quote, on the next day, the world was a little changed. The type 1 HPPD is uh, benign. Some even welcome this experience and joke about them as, as free trips. They're not distressing. They don't interfere with your life. It's a re-experiencing of some of the uh, perceptual changes that occurred when you were on that, that substance. And, uh, and then type 2 is uh, more of a a longer term intermittent uh, reoccurring of some of these hallucinations, mostly visual, that uh, comes with distress, impairment, and is worth keeping in mind as practitioners and as participants uh, in this space. Uh, next slide. And like, uh, well, HPPD is. There have been about 50 papers describing it, mostly case series, a handful of open label studies, and it does tend to show up in individuals with uh, a little more in individuals with depression, anxiety, bipolar, and psychotic illness. And the, some of the top triggers identified are stress, uh, psychedelic use, and things that uh, Besides stress, things that increase arousal in general. And uh, there was there was a study 
that I found interesting in 2016 by Halpern, who's done a lot of work on this uh, condition that showed that uh, of the 20 people they studied, many of them even had some of these perceptual symptoms before hallucinogen use, showing that it's not so simple. It's not always a matter of take the medicine, have reoccurring symptoms, um, and that there, there's more of a, of a, uh, a process going on in which uh, these perceptual brain pathways are changed for one reason or another, and psychedelics open up those doors, and uh, it's something to be aware of. Let's go on to the next slide, and we'll get to uh, what's happening and what to do about it. So recurring perception and visual disturbances described with pretty much every psychedelic and then some. Even There's even one case in the literature of uh, this happening after treatment with risperidone in someone who's never had a psychedelic. And they are mostly visual. And one uh, thing to point out is that in schizophrenia, most of the hallucinations are auditory, not always. And in substance-induced psychoses, most of the hallucinations tend to be visual. And uh, the prevailing theory is that it, it comes from just cr we talked about the mechanism for how hallucinations show up and it's just a persistence of that or an intermittent uh, showing up of that inhibitory process of uh, what's going on in the visual cortex and uh, let's go to the next slide this is a, a different phenomenon uh, but somewhat related is that uh, sometimes the psychotic symptoms be up besides the visual effects persist, like uh, delusional thinking um, in addition to or um, apart from the visual perceptive uh, changes. And uh, how it's defined in the literature mostly is 48 hours later, if there's still some uh, psychotic type, type symptoms, we'll call it prolonged psychosis, and you can see the rates of this like less than a percent in 5,000 volunteers of LSD or masculine studies, for example. And they do tend to, does tend to show up in individuals with uh, mental health conditions, as you, as you can guess, and in, in general in individuals with a negative affective state, especially if there's a history of any psychotic illness. This uh, shows why the exclusion criteria in many studies uh, addresses psychosis, not just in the individual, but in their family member, which would uh, put them at risk, uh, at a little bit higher risk from genetic studies. Uh, let's go on to the, the next slide. Point one, I want to highlight the most, whether it's HPPD or prolonged psychosis, less is more when it comes to treating these. The key is uh, creating the safe container and holding space. And that, uh, for as long as it's needed. And of course, there are times when medications might be helpful. And uh, the judicious use of medications, there are, there are some studies on HPPD in particular of clonidine, uh, a blood pressure medicine that we use for opiate withdrawal, for example, that showed improvement in most, uh, even remission in one case. Benzodiazepines, while addictive and to be used just on a short-term basis, have uh, shown some benefit in reducing reducing some of these symptoms. And, uh, and there's some logic as to why, because of their effects on those GABA or inhibitory interneurons. And antipsychotics, uh, low-dose Haldol and related medicines have been found helpful. I mentioned Risperdal, where there was a case of HPPD afterwards. And if you look at Risperdal's unique mechanism, there is some over arousal and nor noradrenaline release. I, I mentioned TMS here because it's a modality I work with for depression and OCD, but there's some evidence to show how transcranial magnetic stimulation can be helpful for hallucinations in psychotic illness. And there is theory about how it might help with uh, HPPD as a non-medicine, non-invasive treatment. Uh, if someone is really struggling with, with this condition and a lot of impairment, uh, the risk is low in introducing this modality, even though it's not uh, 
approved and well studied. Uh, there is a lot more work to do in this area. Um, and how TMS works, just a note on this, is it's a MRI strength magnet that you aim at a specific pathway of the brain or brain area to either wake up a dormant pathway or modulate an overactive pathway depending on the frequency of the pulse you, that you set. So for depression, we'll, we'll uh, do that uh, higher frequency that will bring back to life that sleepy depression pathway. And in OCD, it's a different kind of frequency that'll help modulate that, uh, that process in the brain in a different way. And those are both FDA cleared indications. Uh, next slide. And Adele, I'll let you uh, take this one. Yeah, so thanks, Reed, for um, giving us all that information. It's amazing. I always learn so much, you know, from your perspective, your take on, on, on this conversation. And a couple of things that just came to mind while you were presenting was that, um, you know, when we talked about time and support uh, in the context of HPPD or, or psychospiritual emergencies, uh, depending on how we want to label that experience, less is more when it comes to medicating. And I just wanted to kind of comment on that a bit more. Like, I so appreciate you saying that as a psychiatrist and also providing that balanced perspective that in some cases we really do need to use some of these. And um, another case that I, I was involved with in a peripheral way, you know, the individual was really suffering um, post psychedelic experience and it was on the razor's edge, you know, of, of providing time and support to help them move through the experience in a good way versus using um, psychotropics to help curb the experience. And it ended up coming down to um, the fact that the person needed to work and they needed to get back to work. And so they, don't, they didn't have the luxury actually of being able to use, to use time and space to move through that experience. And so it was, uh, it was definitely a dilemma for, for those involved in terms of how to address it. So it, it just raises um, interesting questions. The other piece I would say is that um, some of the risk factors that are identified when it comes to psychedelic medicine come from uh, case series or some old data. And so although we want to present the state of the science um, as what it is right now, it's also a good idea for the scientific community, the research community to kind of continue to explore um, these risks in a more systematic fashion because there is some controversy around certain risks around, for example, um, serotonin syndrome. So there's many people who really strongly believe in it, other people who are not 100% sure about it and how it works and so on and so forth. And so it's just a, a shout out to the research community that um, it's, it's probably a good idea for us to kind of continue to revisit these conversations as we move forward um, uh, in a good way. So a few last points to ponder, psychedelics and psychotropics don't need to be mutually exclusive. I, we haven't quite figured out the algorithm, but we believe that there is a way for them to work well together. Um, and though it can be safe from a medical perspective to combine certain medications with plant medicines and psychedelics, one thing that is worth mentioning that Reed and I learned um, from our experiences interviewing and working with different practitioners is that it's actually just as important to consider the spiritual and energetic implications of the use of these medications. So I'll give you an example. So for example, um, someone is using blood pressure medication and according to the medical safety standards, that's not a problem with this particular psychedelic. However, um, if you know, if, if in the case of ayahuasca, as an example, the ceremony leader might say, oh, you know, I understand that it's medically safe, but there are going to be some spiritual or, or energetic implications in terms of how I work with this person, because I'm going to be having to work with the spirit of that medicine. That was something I had never considered. I really hadn't. And so it was such a wake up call for me to not just look at it from that point of view, but also to look at it from this spiritual and energetic space. And so um, just um, the importance of involving ceremonial leaders, indigenous people, 
um, as well as researchers and clinicians so that we can make sure that we're kind of um, understanding the question from all of the different perspectives or at least as many perspectives as possible because in the five or six, seven years that I've been doing this work, I have been amazed at um, how many blind spots I've had um, you know, given where I come from and, and who I am in this space. And so that's been a huge teaching that I'd like to share. Um, we have a long way to go. We could dream up, you know, 1700 different research studies that we want to tackle in our careers. And we're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, it's, it's such a worthwhile pursuit uh, to continue looking in this direction. And so I really want to encourage anyone who's considering a career in psychedelic medicine to think about it so seriously. It's so, um, it's such an enriching process and already we're starting, we're seeing how it's going to affect the lives of so many people in a positive way. And so as clinicians and researchers in this field, like we have witnessed firsthand the healing that can occur for those suffering from mental health issues, especially for those for whom conventional methods have not been effective because when you have tried everything that the medical system has to offer, there can be a narrative of either shame or self-blame that there must, there must be something wrong with you or that you're broken or that there's no hope. And, you know, we have, um, emails from all kinds of different people who have reached out to us either because of the research we do or the work that we do in this space and have shared with us just miraculous stories of healing and the healing and define in their own terms and so it may not be how we would describe optimal healing um, but there's so much possible and so uh, we just feel really excited to be a part of it so we'll finish off with this quote science is not only compatible with spirituality it is a profound source of spirituality when we recognize our place in an immensity of light years in the passage of ages when we grasp the intricacy beauty and subtlety of life then that soaring feeling that sense of elation and humility combined is surely spiritual so are our emotions in the presence of great art or music or literature or acts of exemplary selfless courage such as those of Mohandas gandhi or martin luther king jr the notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. And I can say that I have felt so energized to, when I finally realized that um, working in this space, working in science is actually one of the most spiritual experiences that I've ever, ex I've ever had. And when we look at the unfolding of the inner healing intelligence, for example, and the oneness that so many people experience in the context of psychedelic medicines, and we look at it, for, we, we have an opportunity as scientists, as clinicians, as researchers to do something so, so, so mean, meaningful. And so it's just an opportunity to um, bring so much more depth to the everyday work that we do. So thank you so much for your participation, uh, for your attention. We hope that at least some of the little nuggets of information have been helpful to you and we are open to questions should you have any. Hey folks, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, a lot of very, uh, yeah, like pertinent and specific things as well as a, a really beautiful general message. So thank you for diving deep and also giving a more broad um, kind of um, perspective on, on everything that's happening. I, I'd love to, you know, start off with something a bit more, um, a bit more general and, and would love to hear both of your perspectives on, you, you finished off with this idea of um, kind of the combination of science and spirituality. Uh, in what ways do you both feel, I guess, limited in your abilities to explore that from a research perspective to actually be able to combine those worlds and what steps do you feel like you'll be taking over these next, you know, five, 10 years to be able to really see that emergence happen? I think that one, one of the things that we need are more tools, measurement tools, so that we can have a better grasp of spiritual experiences when it comes to mystical experiences or spiritual experiences. There's definitely a lot of research to support 
spirituality, mystical experiences as a mechanism of change. And we're just working on um, a paper that we're hoping to publish in the next few weeks where we found that um, psychedelic users had higher levels of spirituality and that that predicted increases in emotion processing abilities and that that in turn predicted uh, better outcomes in general mental health and anxiety, depression, and um, eating disorder symptoms. But one of those, if you're asking about what we could do differently, what we could look at more, uh, I would look at different measurement tools. Honestly, that's one mm -hmm. of the things that is important. Um, and also language so that we can, um, we can broaden our vocabularies to talk about some of these experiences that are really hard to put into words and i understand that's one of the features of spirit of a spiritual experience of a mystical experience but i think more can be done so that we can capture the nuances of individuals experiences mm -hmm. definitely um it, going to uh, something pretty specific in the talk and kind of extending off of that um hppd i'd really love to you know hear when folks are experiencing possibly um you know, effects yeah. after psychedelic experiences that might not feel like they were there beforehand. Um, I guess, what are the cases where it's advised that you step away uh, for a while? What is the, what, what are the circumstances where you basically say, okay, this is someone who should never be interacting with these because these are clear indications that this is um, not a good pairing, this individual with this uh, compound? Um, and where would you say it's, you know, possibly even um recommended to actually step in and to re-engage with the with the psychedelic compound well i can jump in here i think uh it's hard to give a one-size-fits-all answer to that it's a very good question important point on when to dive back in and when to continue working with the material that that came of it or when there are just too many risks to going back in. And uh, there is a blurred line between those two concepts as we've seen in the, the psychotic experience during can be therapeutic afterwards. And some of it can persist. There's this, there's this way of conceptualizing uh, HPPD that I, that I kind of like in calling uh, it a I think the term is psychoma where it's a foreign body in the mind that you, your uh, the, the other parts of you are reacting to and saying, this is strange, something is different. And uh, it's a reflection of your internal processes and, and uh, level of uh, over control versus uh, of chaos where you are on that spectrum. But uh, to get back to your question, I think, uh, I think it's really a process to work through uh, very carefully with your uh, with your therapist, with whoever is guiding you through. And when in doubt, keep integrating, keep working on it, uh, because the risks uh, in general fall more on the side of uh, going too fast, uh, too frequently into things. But Adele, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I, th I, I agree with everything that you said. And I think also we just have to be, we're just aware of our language, like we're using the words psychosis and psychotic and, and um, there are different ways to label these experiences. And you know, depending on who you are, where you come from, you might speak of them differently. And so just, just putting that out there in terms of the awareness that these aren't necessarily perceived as negative uh, events, they can lead to really positive events, um, but it is important to use an individual approach because the experience is gonna mean something different to every individual and the course of action might be different depending on who they are um, what, what kind of supports that they have and what their individual needs are within that space. Uh, Adele, you, you mentioned um, basically uh, d different tools to be able to really allow for us to j just learn more in, in, in a sense. And I was wondering uh, both of your perspectives on um, technologies like quantified citizen uh, and uh, I guess more uh, anecdotal research that's, that's coming out of the space. Um, which which uh, methodologies for actually gathering more data, understanding these psychedelic compounds and their effects more, are you uh, both really excited about? And I guess, which ones are you a bit more cautious, uh, cautious towards? It's a good well, question. Well, How's that one to you, Reed? Uh, so I could tell you how we like to use clinically and in studies we design. It is... Uh, 
a whole battery of assessments beforehand to really get at someone's background, including the ACE, Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire, including, uh, well, depending on where the individual is coming from, it could be a deep dive on your level of uh, your relationship with food and body, your, uh, your anxiety, mental, negative affective states. But the most interesting to me, the most exciting to me is when we've given right after ceremony in uh, working with these medicines, we've given the mystical experience questionnaire and the emotional breakthrough inventory, and then looked at that in real time uh, to follow a group through the process. And, uh, because there is literature, as you've probably seen, uh, coming mostly from psilocybin that shows that if you have a high score on the mystical experience questionnaire, and you have an emotional breakthrough, meaning a difficult one, and you make it through to the other side, then you're more likely to have lasting changes or lasting effects in your well-being. And so uh, we use those uh, routinely in this work and it's been really powerful. Beautiful. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Adele, Reed, thank you so much for coming on, for sharing your perspectives, for answering questions. We really appreciate the both of you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Congratulations on this conference. <laughs> Thanks. We did our best. So thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Great job.